that you took him with all that you have this morning. That you remember all the things that God got you out of. That you would just praise him because we are so thankful, God, for you this morning. We are thankful, God, for what you have done and what you're going to continue to do. So, God, we hear the sound of the river coming down this morning. We hear the sound of sons and daughters prophesy. We take the land. We take the land. We take the land. We take the land. We take it. We take it. We take it, God. We take it, Lord, with authority, God, with power, God. You've given us, God, the power, the authority to say we take the land. Oh, come on, if you're excited, give him a shout of praise this morning. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming, coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming, coming down. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Take the land, take the land. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Take the land, take the land. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Take the land. Take the land. It's being poured out. 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 It's coming down. Pour it out. Pour it out. It's being poured 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 out. Pull it out, pull it out, pull it out. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming, coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming, coming down. Sons and daughters, 
sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Take the land, take the land. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters prophesy. Take the land. Oh, come on, take prophesy the land. Sons and daughters. Sons and daughters prophesy. Sons and daughters, sons and daughters, prophesy. Take the land, take the land. Sons and daughters, sons and daughters, prophesy. Sons and daughters, prophesy. Take the land, take the land. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming, it's coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming, it's coming down. Oh, come on, give him a shout. Give him a shout. Hey. I can't get enough of your presence. 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 I
I may not know where you're at right now, but God knows. If you're walking into something that you have the choice to say yes or no, but you know it's not right. Or if you're in that place where you just feel stuck in that, in that mess. Or maybe you're at the very end and you're saying, God, I am sick and tired and I am stuck in this, but I want out this morning. Right now, we have a voice. We have a sound of praise that God has given us for a weapon. And I can stand here and testify that my worship has gotten me out of some dark things. I can stand here and testify that when I was stuck, God came and rescued me when I cried out to him. So this morning, we're in the house of God. And we're not going to stay stuck in that place because he's given us a voice. He's given us a shout. So we're going to worship him this morning. So if you need breakthrough, if you need deliverance, 
If you're tired, if you're sick and being tired, come on this morning, we're gonna sing out to God and we're gonna take him for who he is. He's true, he's faithful, he's gonna rescue you today. He's gonna take you out of that place. We're not playing games, we wanna come here for the real thing. So God, we pray this morning that you would take us, take us from that place as we worship you. And if you just need his love, love is here for you. Love is here for you. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, oh, oh. yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, oh, oh. yes, you are good. You're good, oh, and let the king of my heart be the wind inside of my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside of my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins. Come on, that's not who he is. You're never gonna let 
You're never gonna let me down. Come on, he's faithful and true. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. And you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you are good, you're good. Yes, you are who good, who good. Yes, you are who good, who good. Yes, you are who good, who good. Come on, we're gonna lift up our shout this morning. We're gonna lift up our praise because God is good. Oh, he's so good. Come on, take a hold of your breakthrough. Take a hold of the love of God this morning. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Take it in there and it's for you. You are good. You are good. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you are who good, you are good. Oh, yes, you are who good, you are good. Oh, yes, you are good, you are good. Oh. Yes, you are good. You're so good. Oh, the night is golden arms in the world. Oh, my God.
Come on, give him a hand clap. Because he's still holding on. 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 Amen. 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 How y'all doing this morning? Amen. Amen. This beautiful Sunday morning that God has given us. Amen. Where else can you be blessed in the middle of February with weather like this? Amen. Amen. Today I got the privilege of uh, and the honor of leading the church in prayer. Amen. So join with me as uh, we go before God and just lift up this service before God. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you, my God, humbly, my God, with grateful hearts, Lord God, that we, my God, are seeking more of you, Lord God. On this day, my God, this Valentine's Day, the day that we celebrate as love, my God, I pray, my God, that we know real love, Lord God, that unfailing love, my God, of yours, my God, that love, my God, that when we weren't even born yet, my God, you knew us and you loved us, Lord God. When we fought against you, you loved us, God. When we turned our backs against you, you still loved us, God. Father, I pray, my God, that people, my God, shall be here to experience, my God, that love that you have for us. They will know that love that you have for us, Lord God. Father, I pray, my God, that you, my God, shall be moving in this service, Lord God. That your Holy Spirit, my God, shall be flowing in this place, Lord God. That hearts shall be touched, lives shall be changed, Lord God. That no man, no woman, my God, uh, shall leave this place the same, my God. But that they shall, my God, experience, my God, a touch of you, my God, within their hearts, my God. I pray, my God, for our pastors, that you will touch them, Lord God. I lift them up before you, Lord God. You will strengthen them in these times, Lord God. Give them divine wisdom and knowledge and understanding of what you have for them, Lord. I pray, my God, that you, my God, shall just continue to move in this place. Lord, that building, my God, that we are waiting for, my God. I know you have it already for us, Lord God. Father, I pray, my God, that you will be glorified in this place this day, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we praise you, we thank you, we give you all the glory, and we all come together, and we all say amen and amen.
Amen. Welcome, Powerhouse. It's good to be in the house of God. You know, uh, today, you know, there's um, there's a greatest love story. You know, you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelations, and it's God's love story to all of us. It's the only book that will keep you falling in love over and over and over again. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. You know, if you, uh, you, you got your sweetheart right here in church, you know, just look at her in the eyes and just say, babe, you're beautiful. Happy Valentine's Day. If you want to give her a kiss, go ahead. It's all right. Now, take notes, okay, for people that are single. Take notes, you know, just, you know, you know what? God's going to bring you the right person. Even if you have to wait a while, God will bring you the right per- person. Amen. But this morning, we just want to welcome all our first-time guests. Welcome to Powerhouse Church. And if you are looking for a, a, a place to worship, uh, to receive the word, and you, you're just looking for a home, consider this your home. Okay? And, uh, you know, we, we just love to uh, welcome you and just to uh, let you know we love you. Amen? But uh, we have a few um, announcements. Amen. Baby dedications for the month of not February, but March. Well, we're almost in February. So if you want to dedicate one of your little ones, please see Josie Rodriguez. And she's um, there. And um, dedicate the little babies. Amen. Let's give them back to the Lord. Amen. Uh, Right after service, if we could have a few of the guys come on and help us uh, uh, rearrange the chairs and all that, we will appreciate it. Okay, guys? So if we can get your help. And February 21st, we have a ministry fair going on. Amen? Now, if you don't know what the ministry fair is, is we're going to represent all our ministries. We're going to be outside, and we're just going to show you what ministries there are at Powerhouse Church. And, you know, there there be uh, some sign-ups, and maybe you're interested in one of the ministries, and you can sign up, okay? And we will look into it and uh, see where God has uh, the perfect fit for you at our church, amen? And so that's exciting. That's going to be next Sunday right after service. But what's more exciting than that is us men are going to be right here, and we are going to have our men's, our first men's discipleship of the year at 7 p.m., and it's $10 per person, and you can sign up with Joel Torres, the good-looking guy with the beard right there, raising his hand, and um, it's $10 per person, okay? And that, you know what? You get a lot for that. You, you can't go to a buffet and get fed two times there uh, with the word and food. You can only get fed physically at another place, and you still got to pay a lot. And so, you know what? Come out, guys. I want to encourage you. Okay, men, come out. We the men of the house, and we need to stand strong, and we need to represent. Amen. So I expect to see all the guys here. I'm I'm, I'm watching, and we've got you on film, everything. And so we don't want Ernie to go to your house and start knocking at the door, okay, and say where you're at, all right? (laughs) March. Now, this is exciting. Now, this is exciting. March 5th through the 7th, we're going to have a Three service revival with Prophet Rob Sanchez. Now, I remember him back in the day when he first started out, I used to question him. I'll be honest with you. He's like, what? You know, he's, he's prophesying and all that. But as, as I got to know him, he's right on the money. He is legit. He would be one I would call a prophet. And I remember before I got into the hospital, uh, he prophesied over my wife and I online. And everything that he said came to pass. He didn't know what we were going through. He didn't know what we're up against. But he just gave us that word that got us through uh, the time that I, uh, I was in the hospital. And so, you know what? You don't want to miss out. You do not want to miss out on these three night revival with him. And bring somebody. Bring somebody. If you can, bring, bring everybody. Bring your deals, hands, everybody. Everybody you can think of, 
And we're also going to be um, uh, here all those nights. So, you know, it's exciting. Amen. March 14th, we are starting a new beginner's class. Amen. Sunday mornings at 845. Wow. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I know you're like, oh, okay, 845. I thought it was going to be like later on in the day. No. 845, right when you're wide awake, bring your coffee. And, you know, it's just like when you work out, it's the best time to work out is what? First thing in the morning. Burn off all everything. All right. So come in and uh, see it. And, you know, it's going to be exciting. We're, we're really excited about this. Amen. Wednesday service, 7 p.m. Prayer is at 6 p.m. Invite somebody to come out. We are in the midst of revival. And we don't want to stop. We want to continue to reach the lost. We want to continue just to press forward with what God has for our church. Amen. And, you know, let's just keep praying also that God's going to provide that building for us. We're outgrowing this building. We can rebel and just knock down a wall, but we're not. Okay, we're not. Okay, we're, 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 we're good Christians here. But we need a big building. Keep that in prayer. Amen. Amen. Can we, can we, we receive an offering for the Lord. Can we do that? Amen. Deuteronomy 14.23, it says, Bring this tithe to eat before the Lord your God at the place he shall choose as his sanctuary. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn of your flocks and herds. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put first God in your lives. Amen. If you need an offering envelope, we have our, our greeters here to give you an, um, an envelope. And before I get into this, I just want to say that you can give on powerhouseoc.org. You can text to give 714-710-1981. And you can call it in also at 562-298-7145 in regular business hours, okay? Don't go calling at 3 in the morning because I don't want to see my number change on this. All right, people could just be clowning me and calling me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Pastor, I want to give. Uh, no, no. And you know it's going to be Pastor Rosie disguising her voice. You know, I want to give. All right, Steve, I'll get you back. I'll get you back. But the purpose of tithing is to teach us to always put God first in our lives. It don't get much clearer than that. We're not giving money because he needs it, but rather because it teaches us to put God first above all else. We have a church full of servants that have decided to put God first. From the temperature checkers, greeters, ushers, the team who comes in and cleans the restrooms, sanitizes the building and the rooms, the children's church volunteers, check-in team, the sound media the worship team, all those who come early to set up and stay late to clean up, our pastors who make sure that uh, through our tithes and offerings, the rent and bills are paid for, for us to stay open. We believe in the vision of Powerhouse Church. We believe in the vision to reach the lost, the vision to keep our church doors open and our future building. We've all decided to partner together for the vision. Because we all believe in putting God first. This morning, can we put God first in our tithes and offerings? Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. Thank you, Lord, for this offering that, God, I know you're going to bless. Lord, I know, Lord, that you've already put it in the hearts of your people to give. Because, Lord, I believe we're a giving church. Lord, I believe, God, that that building, God, that you're preparing for us. I believe you're gonna, we're going to see a revival of new people, God. We believe, God, that new ministries are going to rise up. Lord, that we're just going to explode, God, with revival, Lord. And we just thank you, God, that, Lord, that you've chosen us at this time, Lord, to serve you. Bless this offering, God. In Jesus' mighty name, we all agree by saying amen and amen. Coming down, I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming, coming down. 
sound, listen to the sound. Listen to the sound, listen to the sound. Listen to the sound, listen to the sound. Come in down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming, coming coming down. Oh, come on, give me a little shout of praise this morning. Man, praise the Lord. How's everybody doing this morning? Come on. Are we awake this morning? Yes. So how are we doing? Are we blessed to be in the house of God this morning? Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it's so good to be here in the presence of God and to see all you lovely people here. If this is your first time again, we want to just welcome you out here to Powerhouse. Amen. We want you to feel at home. We want you to feel like, you know, you are special which you are special in the eyes of God, amen. But we also want you to just feel like, hey, you, you can just fit right in here, amen, and, and, you know, just allow God to work in your life and see what God has in store for you. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning we have a baby dedication that we are going to present. Our church doesn't, we don't struggle with having babies. That's the beauty of it, amen. We're going to grow. So it's exciting just to see all these families multiplying, amen, and uh, seeing their families grow and see these kids grow up and serving God and knowing God. And so we're excited this morning to have uh, uh, Hugo and Brittany Hernandez are going to be coming up, and amen, and they are going to be dedicating their son, Cruz Hernandez, and the godparents will be Kenny and Martha as they come up. A handsome little boy. If there's family or friends that want to take pictures, you guys are more than welcome to come up right now and take pictures of him and the family. Amen. But we're excited. It's always great, amen, to just celebrate and also to recognize uh, as we sell, um, as we dedicate um, Cruz Hernandez to the Lord. Amen. And uh, one thing I know is that the reason why our children are so blessed is because of our obedience to God. Amen. And I believe that the more that we surrender to God, our lives and our will to God, and we serve him and and uh, we apply the very things of of Christianity into our life, our kids uh, will mimic and learn how to serve God as well. I mean, you know that our kids mimic everything we do when they're little. Right. If I was to go right now to the kids class and and, and just see how they react, more than likely your kids are are impersonating you as mom and dad. And so, again, but when we are obedient to God and we, we pray and we seek the Lord and we serve him, amen, our kids will know how to worship and know how to pray and, and do all those things. Again, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, direct, or the word direct can also mean train your, tri- your children unto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Amen. So many of our kids who are infant or or just newborn are constantly transitioning from one class to the next, meaning that they are growing up and they are learning the word of God. They're not just being uh, babysit in our classrooms right now. They're being actually taught the word of God. And so there are seeds that are being planted into your children. Now, that's one way that that, that, that they are learning the word of God. But when we leave the house of God, Now, as mom and dad, it is your responsibility to continue to plant more seeds into your children, to train them, amen? And so that is our responsibility. I'll finish with saying this. Joshua 24, 15 says that Joshua told the Israelites, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord, amen? Me and my family, you and your family will serve the Lord regardless of what's taking place in your life. And here, Brittany and Hugo have decided to dedicate their child to the Lord, but they're also making a a declaration, a statement that as for them and their family, they will serve the Lord. So they had chosen Kenny and Martha to be the godparents to pray and intercede uh, for little Cruz here. And they're believing that, or we're all believing, and we will will declare that he is going to grow up and be a mighty man of God. Amen. And God's going to work in him. And so at this time, I'm going to give Hugo and Brittany uh, an opportunity that they, if they want, would like to share a few words 
of uh, you know their son or this dedication. <laughs> Amen. Um, yes, so we're so honored and privileged to have Mark and Kenny be Chance's godparents. Um, you guys mean so much to us. I know I speak for both of us when I say this. Um, just since uh, the beginning of our journey together, since you both started discipling us and pouring into us, um, you know, your love for our, us and our children was so unconditional, even before Cruz was in the picture. And, um, you know, so I know that so many people choose you as their children's godparents for a reason. It's because of what you carry and uh, what your life displays. It speaks so much louder than words. And, um, you know, one of the things that makes me emotional when I pray for you both and Cruz is, um, you know, the meaning of his name, Cruz, the cross represents Christ. And Hendrix, his middle name, um, means ruler of the home. Christ is the ruler of the home. And I know that, you know, for him, that declares something for his future and his generations to come. But not only that, for your family, um, you know, it's not just what you teach, Hugo and I, but um, what your life shows us, what you display um, by your actions. And, um, you know, I'm believing that the power of the meaning of his name will, um, you know, do powerful things, not just for our family, but for yours and for your children and your children to come, their children to come, sorry. <laughs> and uh, we're just so blessed to have you guys um, take on this role. We thank you for your yes, not just for us time and time again, but for taking on this new role. Um, and, you know, I just thank you that we don't have to question that we can count on you guys. And we just love you guys so much. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. We are beyond honored and privileged to not just have this um, place in Cruz's life, but in your guys' life. And it really, iron sharpens iron. And yes, um, they call us their disciples, but they really have been friends that have been true in and out of season. They have blessed us beyond measure. And we are so blessed to have a place in Cruz's life. Um, we, we had prayer the other day at our house and we were praying for them. And as we were praying for them, Cruz was raising out his hand. And, and it's so beautiful because even at this age, he already has that, you know, our children were created to worship God. And he has that sensitivity to the spirit of God. Before we were praying, he was fussy. And when we started praying, he was quiet. He was, um, raising his hands out towards his father as we were praying for his father. And when I prayed for him and just started prophesying over him, he was laughing and giggling and receiving it all. And, and that just goes to show what they've laid out in his life. Amen. And we are so blessed to be able to cultivate the gifts and, and the call of God and partner with you guys in prayer. And we thank you guys. And we truly don't take this lightly. Amen. Amen. She said it all. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We love you guys. Um, yeah, you're more than just. Um, yeah, I had to switch arms. He was. My goodness. <laughs> no, we love you guys. You're you're more than just um, disciples. You're your friends. Amen. And um, family more than that. Amen. Um, and uh, we, um, we love you guys. We can't wait to see what, um, what God does in your guys' life. And we can't wait to see what God does in his life as well with little Hugo and Harmony, too. We're praying over your whole family, amen, and declaring them, declaring them to be uh, gods and always gods and gods forever. And um, them to, be, uh, them to uh, remain in him and God to remain in them and um, that they will never stray, amen. Um, we just love you guys, and um, and yeah, we love you. <laughs> Praise God. Well, if we could all just stretch our right hand, amen. We want to pray for the family, and we want to pray for uh, Cruz as well. And uh, just come in agreement with us this morning, amen. Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord, we lift up. Uh, Cruz Hernandez to you this morning, Father. We dedicate him to you, Father, and we pray that, God, that your hand of protection would be upon his life, Father, from this day forward. Uh, Lord, we pray for, Lord, your covering, God. We pray for his health. 
We pray, God, that you would uh, minister to him and, Lord, that he would uh, grow up to know you all the days of his life, Father, that they would train him, God, your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit, God, would, Lord, touch him and fill him, God. We pray that he would grow up to be a young, mighty warrior for the kingdom, Lord. And we thank you, God, and we pray that, God, that you would continue to move upon this family, upon Hugo and Brittany, God. We pray that, Lord, that they would set the example, that they would set the tone for the home, God, and for Cruz, Lord. We pray that, God, that they would speak life into him, that they would speak the word into him, Lord. I pray for your touch over their life, Father, that as for them and their family, that they will serve you all the days of their life, God. Uh, Lord, I pray, Father, for Kenny and Martha, God, that they as well, God, would intercede and stand in the gap, Lord, and be there for Cruz, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that you would just bring this all together, Lord, these couples and this child, God, and that you continue, Father, to do something great in the midst, Father. We love you this morning, and we give you all the honor and all the glory. And all of God's people shot and said, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. Amen. He is so good. And it's always, I, I was so looking forward to being in the house of God this morning. I hope you as well were looking forward for today. Uh, yesterday I was just like, man, I can't wait to just be in the presence of God. You know, just to, just to be in the midst of other believers. It's, nowadays it's difficult to be around, uh, amongst each other because of everything that's going on. But the moment we have that opportunity to gather together, it is such a great, amazing time that we can gather together and just not only worship God, but to be able to have fellowship with each other. Amen? It's so good to do that. I want to get right into today's message. And uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Judges, chapter 16. Judges, chapter 16. And we're going to begin in verse 4 this morning. I want to minister on a message that I've entitled, Do You Love Me? It is Valentine's, so happy Valentine's to all, to every person here today, whether you're married or not. Amen. Happy Valentine's. But the title of my message is, Do You Love Me? And I think we've all said those words maybe once or twice or maybe a thousand times to someone. Either we've told that to, a, when we were young, we told that to our parents, Do You Love Me? When it's Christmas time, Do You Love Me? If you're married, we, we tell our spouse, Do You Love Me? Right? We're always saying those words and Typically, the reason why we say those words is we want affirmation, but also we want something. We're looking for something. Amen? We, we, we want an extra gift or we want something of material that we've been wanting or yearning for. But this morning, I want to talk about a story here in Judges chapter 16, verse 4. And let's all stand this morning as we open up and read God's word. Bible reads, it says, sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me. What makes you so strong, and what would, what would it take to tie you up securely? Samson replied, if I were tied up with seven new bowstrings that have not yet been dried, I will become as weak as anyone else. So the Philistine rulers brought Delilah seven new bowstrings, and she tied Samson up with them. She had hidden some men in one of the inner rooms of her house, and she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson snapped the bowstrings as a piece of string snaps when it is burned by a fire, so the secret of his strength was not discovered. Afterward, Delilah said to him, you have been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now please tell me how you can be tied up securely. And Samson replied, if I were tied up with brand new ropes that had never been used, I would become as weak as anyone else. 
So Delilah took new robes and tied him up with them. The men were hiding in the inner room as before, and again Delilah cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But again Samson snapped the robes from his arms as they were thread. Then Delilah said, you have been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now tell me how you can be tied up securely. And Samson replied, if you were to weave the seven braids of my hair into fabric on your loom and tied it, tied, um, tied in it with the loom shuttle, I will become as weak as anyone else. So while he slept, Delilah knit the seven braids of his hair into the fabric. Then she tied in it with the loom shuttle. And again, she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson woke up, pulled back the loom shuttle, and yanked his hair away from the loom and fabric. Then the light it pouted, how can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? You made fun of me three times now, and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. She tormented him with her nagging days. Listen to that. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. And finally, Samson shared his secret with her. He was already done. He was tired of hearing all the nagging. He says, my hair has never been cut, he confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. Delilah realized he had finally told her the truth, so she sent for the Philistine ruler. Come back one more time, she said, for he has finally told me his secret. So the Philistine rulers returned with the money in their hands. Delilah calmed Samson to sleep with his head in her lap, and then she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. In this way, she began to bring him down, and his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. When he woke up, he thought, I will do as before, shake myself free. But he didn't realize that the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and cut out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze, cha uh, bronze chains and forced to crush grain in the prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to move in the remainder of this service. Lord, we need you today. We pray, Father, that you would speak to us. We pray that hearts would be touched and transformed. We pray, God, for healing. We pray, God, that you would do a mighty work this morning, God. Let us hear what you have to say to us this today, God. Let us not, God, let us not close our ears, but let us allow you to do whatever it is that you want to do in us today, Father. We love you, we thank you, and we honor you today. In Jesus' mighty name, we all shout and said, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated this morning. One of the things that we know and find here in Scripture is that even adults with God's anointing upon their life can be blindsided by love. Whether you're, you're in the ministry or not in the ministry, whether you're saved or not saved, I think we all can agree this morning that we have been blindsided at one point or another by love. And Samson here, when you read this story or have heard this story when you were little, in maybe in Sunday school, we've known that Samson was one of the strongest men to have ever lived. But that didn't keep him from playing the fool. Listen to me this morning. How many times have we played the fool while being blindsided by love? Where we've done weird stuff and foolish stuff. Amen? Love will make you do some crazy things. Love will make you act like a child. Listen to me. That's what love does. Even when it comes to the kingdom, when it comes to salvation, when we fall in love with God, God dramatically changes our lives. 
and we become like children. And I'm not saying we act like children, but now we're his children and we are free to worship him. And like the Bible says in spirit and in truth, which before where we would go to church, we would just stand there and, and be tough and, and prideful and have walls up and, and, and it was religious. But when you allow Jesus to come into your heart and you encountered the love of God, the true love of God, the agape love of God, is that all of a sudden you were free and you, your eyes were open to the truth which is the word of God, and God showed you how, what true love really is and what it's about. So Samson here, when he met Delilah, he knew in his mind physically that he had found the perfect girl. All it took was just one look, and he fell in love. Just like many of us today, when you married your spouse, all it took was just one look. One look. Amen? And that just jacked you up. And there are times where you'll sit with your spouse and you say, man, you jacked me up. That outfit you wore that one day when I first laid eyes on you, it jacked me up. He fell in love with her. But the only problem here in the story is that Delilah did not fall in love with him. That's a whole different message in itself. So she pretended to love Samson. But what Samson didn't know is that she was only in it for the money. I got so many messages that I can just go off of those things right there. The problem as well here is that it wasn't Samson's money that she fell in love with or pretending to love him for what he had, but it was the Philistines' money because the Scripture says that the Philistines' rulers were willing to offer her 1,100 pieces of silver to know what it was where he got his strength, how they can pull him down. Listen to me this morning. Delilah here did not want Samson. And they were paying her just to find out what they could do to take him out. So she was probably saying here is that, telling Samson, do you love me? Typically something that we hear when we want something from the, from the opposite sex or maybe from a, a mom or dad or, or whoever it may be. But we say, do you love me? And here Delilah is saying, Samson, do you love me? And of course, Samson is well in love with this woman. But what she really meant when she was saying those words is she was saying is, just give me what I want so that I can leave this relationship and move on. See, she, want, she wanted nothing to do with Samson. Listen, you can have the best of, of you can have the best of motives going into a relationship. But that doesn't mean that someone isn't out to use you for what they can get out of you. Because there are people that will just want to use you for what you have or what they can get out of you. And they will suck you dry. And they will leave you. To die. Three times the Bible says that she tried to have Samson assassinated. But he was so blindsided by love that he overlooked all three attempts. Why? Because she told them she loved him. Love is a powerful word. Again, love will make you see past everything else. No matter how bad it looks. But on the fourth attempt, Delilah succeeded. Why? Because the scripture says that she nagged him day and night. Now, I know we have no one here in this church that nags the significant other or nags our children. 
But nagging can get you some answers. And we know how to work it or try to manipulate a situation by nagging someone. And so after the fourth attempt, she succeeded, and the scripture says that they attacked Samson, and they ripped out his eyes and turned him into a slave. And once that took place, Delilah walked away with the Philistines' money, enough money to, for her to live for a while. See, sometimes we get so caught up in the wrong relationship when it comes to love that we end up set, setting ourselves up for disaster. For some of us, and not all of us, I'm not talking about every, every single person here, but for some of us, the most important thing about choosing a friend, again, I'm not only ministering this morning to married couples, but even singles, so if you're single, take notes. If you're married, that's it, you're married. You ain't going to, you're stuck. It's for life, vida, that's it. To, to death do you part. But listen to me, for some of us, the most important thing about choosing a friend or someone to date and then marry, I want to just say that one more time, to date and marry, we don't just date to date as Christians, we date to marry. We date to marry. And so... What does the per we're so focused on what the person looks like, the attraction, which the attraction is not the final piece. Listen, a person, a person looks are no indicator of what qualities they may possess. And just because they make a great first impression. Don't make it your final stamp of approval. Don't live your life off of first impressions. Live your life off of a person's true qualities. See, because in the beginning, that person will look good. They'll smell good. They'll talk good. They'll open up the door. They'll pay for the meal. But give it a couple of months. And see if they're still doing not only those things, but most importantly as Christians, where do they stand with God? Where do they stand with God? Are they serving God? Are they involved? Are they rooted? Are they grounded in God's word? Because if they're not rooted and grounded in God's word, let me tell you, you are headed for some disaster along the way. If a person happens to look attractive or appealing to you, that's, that's not the icing on the cake. Listen to me. When you choose to love a person, the person always becomes more attractive with time. With time. Why? Because you discover that the qualities are more important. That's what really matters is the qualities that they possess. Because the word of God tells us that Jesus, watch this, Jesus was not a tall, dark, handsome, good-looking person. How do I know this? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, Isaiah 53, 2 says this, It was the will of the Lord that his servant should grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing, watch this, nothing attractive about him. Nothing that would draw us to him. Jesus' looks, his appearance were not noticed. He was not attractive. That's what the scripture says. But that's not what it counts in a relationship. That is not the most important thing about being in a relationship. It's the quality. The qualities and the character of an individual. If that's all you're doing is looking at looks, you're going to go from one relationship 
to another relationship to another relationship. And then you're going to ask yourself, I don't know why I keep falling into these bad relationships. And when you find yourself saying, I keep going from one relationship to another, and they keep being bad, maybe it's because all you're doing is looking at the attraction. Because if that's all you're doing, that person as well is looking for the attraction. I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. The Bible says this, if I were to speak with eloquence in earth's many languages and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I, did, I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with the profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and, I have, and if I possess unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that could move mountains, but have never learned to love, then I am nothing. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I own to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Here is the Apostle Paul speaking here. And he's saying these words. Listen to me this morning. Oftentimes we wonder, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? And what Paul was saying here is making a name for yourself or being super spiritual or having lots of money to give away or working yourself to death for a cause that is not what's going to really matter in life. He says the most important thing is what? Love. Love is the most important thing. It ain't about just having all these gifts. It ain't about having all these material things on earth and all these things that we achieve. But he says here, Paul is saying the most important thing are more important than spiritual gifts, are more important than material things, is love. One of the things that I've known or realized about churches that are thriving and churches that are having huge revival the one thing that they, they are that they do possess in that church, a set apart from gifts and 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 callings and, and all these things that they have, is this, it's love for one another. It's that they learn how to love and work together as a church, as a body, regardless of their differences, regardless of you know, wherever they their upbringing, whatever they, they feel and think, they've learned to love one another and work together. In unity. I believe that as a church, if we can learn to work in love and we can operate in love and we can learn to love the lost church, our church will continue just to break out and see. See, no matter what it is we feel we're called to do, it has to start with the two greatest commandments, which is what? To love God with all your heart, your mind, our soul, and our strength. But then he says what? That we are to love one another as Christ has loved us. He says that. Love one another as Christ has loved us. Now, again, I, I, I know that many of us don't see eye to eye with some people, whether they're saved or not. Maybe in the workplace we don't see eye to eye. Maybe we feel like everybody that has something against us is the devil or a demon. But I do believe is that what God is trying to do is he's trying to teach us how to love even the unlovable. The ones that really just get under our skin. The ones that rub us the wrong way. Set apart from your spouse and set apart from your kids. But if we can't even learn how to love our brother or sister in Christ, church, how do we expect for God to take us from glory to glory? How do we expect God to use our lives to make an impact in someone else's life if we can't even learn how to love one another as believers? 
But yet we try to find excuses and we try to talk to God and reason with God why we feel a certain way towards a certain individual. Well, God, they do this, and God, they don't understand, and God, they just, they're, they, we think of a million of, of excuses of why we have hatred or anger or bitterness towards someone. But yet, the Bible says here, love one another as Christ, Christ, listen to me, as Christ has loved us. Now, Jesus died for our sins, our wrongdoings, our bad choices, our behaviors. He died for all those things. And yet, he still says, I still love you unconditionally, even today. Now, I know that today, no one here can say that they are perfect. That you don't sin. That you follow every scripture in the Bible. That you are a holy saint. But yet, with the beauty of the Word of God and the beauty of who Jesus is, is that in spite of our failures daily, daily that we struggle, daily that we make bad choices, daily that we choose and do wrongdoings, daily that we fall short, yet, he says, in spite of your daily mistakes and struggles, I still love you. He still loves you. He loves you unconditionally, and he wants the best for you. So if he wants the best for us, and he loves us, and he wants to shower us with his love, his grace and mercy, and his blessings upon our life, yet he says, I want you to do the same for those who do you wrong. I want you to love that person whether they're sitting next to you or not, or maybe behind you or across from you, I still want you to love them, regardless of what you think and feel about them. Love them. The problem, church, is that we're still living in our past. We're still living in our old ways of what we consider what love is. When God says, I want you to love this way, but when things don't go your way, your old way of love resurrects again. See, your old way of love always wants to resurrect. That's why the Bible says that we are to daily crucify the flesh. Deny that flesh. Because the old flesh will always want to resurrect and always just want to choose someone based on their looks. But someone that lives in, and walks in the spirit will first look at the quality of a person and choose based of their character and the qualities that they possess as a man or woman of God. So listen to me. God is more concerned about how we interact with one another in our everyday relationships than he is with us having a title or at work or in a position in the church. God's not concerned about you having a new title in the church. That's not his focus. His focus is not you telling God, guess what, God? I just... I led someone to the Lord, which is great. Praise God. You led someone to God. Thank God that God is using you. But God is more concerned on how you love one another. Because you can lead someone to God and still have hatred towards someone else. That's a, that doesn't go hand in hand. Don't go to church and praise me, and the moment you walk out the doors, you're over here speaking death to your spouse or your kids. And so when you read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, people often think it's a chapter for just married couples, but that's not true. This chapter is for all of us as believers. But watch this here. Now, now I'm going to really just really 
pick at you and really just poke at you. Because the Bible says in verse 4, it says love is patient. Love is patient. Tell the person next to you, say love is patient. Love is patient. The Passion Version says it this way. It says, love is large and incredibly patient. Incredibly patient. Incredibly patient. Why would the Passion Version use the word incredibly? Because we need a whole lot of patience when it comes to dealing with people. Listen to me, the word love here means that it has a capacity to be wrong. You're going to be wrong in the midst of love. But the greater thing about it is that if we have this agape love, and we've allowed God to transform our lives, then listen to me, when people do you wrong, and do you nasty, do you dirty, as a believer, you won't want to fight back. The Bible says that vengeance is the Lord. So love is large. You got to see past what people do to you. You got to see past when people are not listening to what you want them to see. And you got to be patient. Because often we are not patient people. When we want something, we want it right then and there. But let me read to you Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24, the Bible says this, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature. And your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. But instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Listen to that. Throw off the old sinful nature, your former way of life. Your former way of what you thought what love was, what you were taught. Some people think that abuse is love. There's a lot of twisted things in our world today that they have have made it okay as something that can be considered love. But yet here the scripture is saying, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupt by lust and deception. That's what the flesh is. It's corrupted. But yet instead, it says here, when you give your life to Jesus, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Let it renew, erase everything of the past. Erase it. Remove it. Now allow God to feed your mind with his word, his spirit, and show you how to truly love the way he wants you to love those that are around you. To put on your new nature, created to be like God. You and I were created to be Christ-like. We were created to be that way. But somewhere along the road, growing up, we were deceived. We were taught wrong things. So here the scripture also teaches us that we are to be patient with people, not with circumstances. The problem, listen to me, the problem is never the problem. It's never the problem. People are always looking at the problem. But it's never the problem that's the problem. Because God is always trying to teach us something in the problem. Patience 
is one of the most sought-out characteristics this list describes in dealing with love. But yet, few are willing to welcome the circumstance which will produce it. We just want the problem to go. We just want to swoop the problem under the rug. We don't want to deal with the problem, but it's in the problem that God is trying to teach us how to deal with certain characteristics in our life. Because if we don't learn how to deal with the characteristics in our lives, your relationships in the future will be hindered and not grow. So if you're wondering I, why I don't, you don't have that many relationships, could it be that there are certain characteristics in your life that you have not yet dealt with? And the relationships that you have now are hurting because you have not yet grown to where God is trying to raise you up and learn a few things. Patience doesn't come for free. It's not like when you pray, you just get it automatically. If, you, if you're a believer and you've been saved long enough, if you pray for patience, how many know that the moment you pray for that, all hell breaks loose? Now, many of you probably will agree that you don't pray for patience, for, you don't pray for it anymore. Like, I ain't going there. I ain't paying for, for patience. They're like, God, I, you know, you know. You don't even want to go there, right? But you get patience, listen to me, you get patience the same way like you get in shape. Watch this. You have to practice in this area of patience. Just like you have to exercise. To be able to get in shape. In order to what? To endure things. To endure circumstances. To grow. I mean, know that saying, there's no pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. It's the same thing like in the kingdom. You got to go through some things to be able to gain some things. If you want to gain patience and you want to grow in your characteristics, then you have to go through some things. You don't just gain it. You have to go through some things. You have to encounter some things in life. So whatever you're encountering right now, don't just look at it as something bad. Don't look at it as, man, am I in sin? Because often we think that when we're going through something, what did I do wrong? It's not that you did something wrong. Is that God is trying to grow you. He's trying to grow you. He's trying to, to develop your faith, your character, your attitude. All of these things. It's just like a runner. That, a runner. When you think of a runner, that, that whether they're doing cross country or any kind of running, they don't stop running the moment their legs start to hurt. They don't stop running the moment they get tired. They keep running until what? They finish, they cross the finish line. Because practice teaches you endurance. It gives you endurance. See, our home is one place where we can learn to practice patience. I think that's probably the biggest thing where we can learn patience is in our own home. Especially when everyone is having a bad day. If you, got, if you got five, six kids and you live in a two-bedroom, oh, you're going to learn a lot, whole lot of patience. Unless you got six bedrooms and everybody has their own rooms, it may, be a little, it may get a little easy, but if you're cramming everybody in, you're going to learn very easily. Or if you're, if, if, you're, if, if, you're, if you're married and you got six girls, you are going to learn a lot of patience. But listen to me, practice, we need to practice in this area of patience. In many of our homes, one thing we can learn is that there's a lot of different interpretations or views of what, listen to me, I was thinking about whether to go in this area or not, but 
We have views of what a clean house looks like. I'm talking about, I'm, I, we can look at this both ways. We can look at it spiritually and we can look at it physically. But let's look at this physically. Because we all have a different view of what a clean house should look like. How we were grown up, brought up, and how mom and dad left the house. And then we get married and we have two different views between a husband and wife of what a house how clean it should look. And when you have two different views and you're not on the same page, oh, you're going to learn so much patience for that. There's going to be a lot of talking back and forth. There's going to be a lot of arguments. But there is something about patience in this area that God wants to develop between not only a husband and wife, but also between ourselves and everyone else in that home. He's trying to teach us a thing or two. Now again, this verse isn't saying that just because love is large and incredibly patient that you accept everyone's standard of clean. That's not what it's saying. Listen to me. What it's saying is that even when someone doesn't do the job the way you want it done, your attitude and your character is still going to be Christ-like. If you're married and you struggle with this, you should have wrote that down right now and remind your spouse that when your spouse wants to be impatient, say, be Christ-like. Be Christ-like. Remember what Pastor said, be Christ-like. Keep your attitude in check. Keep your character in check. See, patience involves you looking past. Someone say past. Past the evil or wrongdoing done towards you. You got to see past it. You got to look past it. There is nothing easy about being patient. Nothing easy. The Bible clearly states that those of you who are married today are going to be tested in patience. You're going to be tested. So if you're single, listen to me, that's one thing that you're going to be tested. Learn patience now. Learn it now. Before you make the decision to say yes to that person. But we always have a choice of how we respond when we're hurt or offended. How does Jesus respond when you and I commit the same sin over and over again? How does he respond when you say, I know I said I would never do it again, but forgive me, Lord. Or how does he respond when you and I make a commitment to do something and we fail to carry it out? See, in every situation, God chooses to respond in what? In love. By what? By granting us his forgiveness. One of the most important qualities a person can have is a willingness to quickly forgive. Patience will, de will help you to de um, develop forgiveness. It's not about just being patient with the person, but it's learning to forgive them. In the moment where you feel like just blowing up. See, the opposite of patient is what? It's anger. If you ain't patient, then you're full of rage. When you can't learn to be patient with people in your home, then you tend to just burst out. God is trying to teach us how to control ourselves. Because that's, that's the old you. The old you wants you just to begin just to speak out and say things that, that will hurt and offend everyone else. 
But patience, learning patience, you begin to develop how to forgive, but how to speak life. How to speak life into those that are dear to you. As the worship team comes up this morning, you know, again, Delilah said, she told Samson, do you love me? She said, do you love me? And Samson replied and said, girl, you know I love you. You know I love you, girl. I'm here, right? If I didn't love you, I would not be here. He made his presence known. And he wanted her to know that by his presence being with her, that it that showed that he loved her. You know, it's the same way when with our relationship with Jesus. We ask Jesus, do you love me? Jesus, if you love me, then why am I going through this? Why do I keep struggling in this area? Why has this not been taken care of yet, God? And we feel as if God does not love us. truth of the matter is that God loves you, but he's trying to teach us some things that we have not yet developed in the moment and in the season so that in the future we can develop and have greater relationships, healthy relationships, not just in a marriage, but in friendship, in a community. That you don't just go to church and say, well, I only have two friends. No, you have a whole household of friends. Why? Because God taught you how to develop qualities that people are attracted to. God is trying to teach us a thing or two in everything we go through. Don't always look at the bad in every situation that goes in your life. But try to look for the good. And I believe one of those things is is God is trying to work in our characteristics. He's trying to teach you patience. He's trying to teach you how to love. He's trying to teach you how to forgive. And so this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe this morning you're at a place in your life where you're struggling. Maybe you were invited by a friend or a family member, but you've never accepted Jesus into your life. You never repeated a prayer of salvation. And maybe there's a few things that I ministered this morning that really just hit, really hit home in your life. Maybe you're thinking, man, who told the pastor all my, my story? Who told them what I'm going through? Who told them that I'm dealing with unforgiveness? Who told them that I struggle with impatience? Who told them that I deal with anger? Who told them that that I'm at a place where I feel like no one loves me? Or people have taken advantage of me? And all you want and all you desire is to be loved. This morning, if you're here and you've never accepted Christ, I want you to know that Jesus truly, truly loves you. And all he wants is for you to accept him. That you would allow him to come into your heart, into your life, so that he could express his love towards you and that you can encounter him. If that's you this morning, I would like for you to just raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Is there anyone here that would like to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Anyone here? Or maybe this morning you're backslidden in your heart where you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. If 
that's you this morning, whether you're a teenager or an adult, I see that hand there. Praise God. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else that said, I want to accept Jesus? I want to recommit my life to Jesus. I see that hand there. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anyone else? Anyone else that would be honest? Come on, God wants to, God, God brought you here this morning. It wasn't by accident. Yes, you were invited, but God already had it all planned out. And God knows right now what you're dealing with. He knows your inner feelings right now. And some of you are hurting. Some of you are struggling. And all he's saying is, let me come in. Let me come in. Is there anyone else that would just be honest and say, I want to give my life or recommit my life to Jesus? Anyone else before I change the order of the service? Hallelujah. Glory to God. This morning, if, if you meant that, if you meant that, you want to accept Jesus or rededicate your life back to God, I want to challenge you right now this morning encourage you to just get out of your seat and come meet me at this altar so that I can pray with you. Would you do that? Would you come up? Would you allow me to pray for you? Young man, would you raise your hand? Would you come up? I want to pray for you. What's your name? Sandra. 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 Nice to meet you. Have everybody else stand this morning. I mean, you know, it's all about reaching the lost. It's all about reaching the lost. It's not about just coming to church as a believer and just getting fed. The Bible says that we are to be doers of the word. Doers. What does that mean? It means that everything that you were taught this morning, everything that was ministered this morning, that we take this word and we take it. We take it to our families. We take it to our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors. And we invite them to come and encounter what you and I have already experienced and encountered with God. We want them to know the true meaning of what real love is, the agape love. But how would they ever know the true agape love if we never share with them the loss again of this love of Jesus? Come on, we all know someone who is not saved, someone that needs Jesus. We all know people that we can literally think of in our top of our head right now, a name or two or many that need Jesus Christ. And I'm going to pray I'm going to pray and believe that God would stir something in your spirit that you'll bring somebody every service. That Wednesday you'll bring someone. You'll bring a family because there are people that are hurting. Marriages that are struggling. Families that are struggling. There are people today literally right now whether they're teenagers or young adults or even adults that are that are, are dealing with depression that are that are wanting to commit suicide. And it is, God says, it is our responsibility as Christians to share the gospel. It's our responsibility, church, to share the good news. 
But aside of that, this morning as I ministered on this message, maybe God was speaking to you. Maybe God was dealing with you and there's some areas and some things that were said that really just God was piercing your heart. And you're like, that's me. That's me. I deal with I deal with that area of not being patient. And because I'm not patient, it is ruining my life. It is ruining my relationship. It is ruining my home. You're dealing with unforgiveness. You're dealing with all sorts of things. Maybe it's anger this morning. Maybe it's bitterness this morning. And I believe that if we can just be real today, if we can just be real and say, and come to an altar like this and say, Lord, I am tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of always being this way. I'm tired that my life is not changing. And it's ruining my home. It's ruining my loved ones. And I believe it's time that we just say, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. God, change me. Change my ways. Change my thoughts. Change my attitude. I want to be Christ-like. I want this day to be a new beginning that from this point on, I'm going to pursue you and I'm going to do my darn best to change. Meaning I'm going to crucify my flesh every single morning. And I'm going to say, no, devil, you're not going to get the best of me today. Today, you're not going to get the best of me. Today, you're not going to get the best of my marriage. You're not going to get the best of my kids. I'm not going to go back to that old lifestyle. I'm telling you this morning, there's nothing for you to go back to. There's nothing to go back to this world. The world has nothing to offer to give you. No drug, no alcohol. There is nothing out there that will satisfy you the way Jesus can. All those things that the world has are temporary. They're temporary. But when we learn to just submit and surrender to God, I'm telling you, God will begin to pour into you and into your home. And, and you'll begin to say, why didn't I do this 10 years ago? Why did I do this 20 years ago? I could have, man, you, it would have saved you so much heartache, so much pain. Come on, I'm going to open up this altar. God is speaking to you. God is touching you. I want you to just get out of your seat right now. We're going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to.